Thank you very much, Charlene. Um, and at first, I just want to thank uh, the roundtable coordinators um, for having me here today. It's a, a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, I want to say that I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today because I've always really um, sort of fed off of the energy of, uh, of this event. Um, and the fact that it has continued for nearly 40 years, I think, is indicative of the timeliness of the TC Roundtable and its central themes. You know, it, it just um, is stunning to me that there are likely scholars here um, who weren't born in February 1983. Um, you know, and um, you stop and think that's maybe like three academic generations if you figure it's like 12 years from your defense to your first doctoral student. So, you know, this is um, an intergenerational um, event. Um, and I think that, um, you know, under the theme of mentoring, um, this is the, the kind of generative event that we're actually celebrating um, this weekend. <clears throat> so I'd like to take um, my time today to talk to you about my own intellectual and professional journey from Benning Elementary School in Washington, D.C., to Teachers College in the City University of New York. This is going to be the Cliff's Notes version. Um, but I'd also like to talk about the round table as an intervention born of the convergence of internet technology and the values that have always underwritten my leadership mentoring and mentoring, recognizing and respecting difference, promoting complex social identifications, equality under the law, and in practice, and work towards social justice. Now, um, in 1953, I had to change schools because of desegregation. It had become the law of the land, and I had to ride a bus past my neighborhood school to integrate another school that had been previously all white. That legal decision would shape the course of my education and career. And I contrast this experience with what might happen today you know, if we had desegregated the schools in today's environment, psychologists would be proposing all kinds of activities to facilitate the transition, and we'd be doing all this training about culture and diversity. Back in 1953, they did it the old school way. They opened the door, they put the black kids in, they locked the door, and they left. And there was no program. You know, it was kind of uh, no programs, no workshops, no preparation. Um, and it was kind of harsh. But I think, you know, back then, the implicit assumption was that we, the black children, would assimilate. That black kids would become more like white kids and the schools would stay the same. That reasoning was flawed because it only took account of race and only tallied race <clears throat> in terms of a deficit or an index of some kind of biological inferiority. Culture, on the other hand, was left out of the formula. The architects of desegregation couldn't imagine that white kids would become like black kids and produce a whole cadre of 21st century white rappers. <laughs> it was very nearsighted. I was very nearsighted as a child and didn't get diagnosed until third grade. So my first two years of school were kind of blurry. But once I got these lenses, many things came into focus. I could see my classmates. We were black, Jewish, WASP, and white ethnics, charged daily um, with learning to do our best and to get along. Once I could see, I became an excellent student and quickly started to enjoy my academic pursuits. Both my parents had college degrees, my dad in math and my mom in biology. And this was a perfect foundation for me to kill it in the science fairs. During my high school years, several professors from TC actually were hired by the DC Board of Ed to systematically um, deconstruct the essentially discriminatory track system that the schools use to manage um, students' education. Once I got my glasses, I was placed in the honors track based on my test scores. I went to Woodson Junior High School, my local mostly black school, where I continued to do well. 
my class integrated Anacostia High School when we arrived about 600 strong to attend a school that had formerly had only 900 white kids. I was the first and only black student in the honors track, the fly in the buttermilk, as they used to say. After my first year, which included a thorough review of my records and test scores, I was still in the honors track. You know, there was something just incongruous about me being in that group. After my sophomore year, I became a counselor when I started working for the United Church of Christ summer camp program. And the summer after my sophomore year, I counseled kids, elementary school kids, in sleepover camp. High school was my first experience of being the first and only black student in a group. I was aware of how it affected my relationship with my white peers and other black students. Black students knew that I was the only one in that group, so it made me prominent. They knew who I was. The black jocks and guys in metal shop knew that I was a black kid in the brainy group, so they were both glad I was there and curious about who I was and what I was about. Walking between two groups was to become a daily experience for me. When I graduated two years later, that counselor role was pretty much central to who I was at the time, having worked three summers as a camp counselor. It was 1965, and the US was in a state of tumult. Dr. King was marching, Vietnam was still underway, race riots were happening in Watts, and the Voting Rights Act had become law. And at the tender age of 18, I was a veteran of several marches on Washington, DC. Building a coalition of black students and white honor students, I managed to get elected senior class president in the fall of 65. Not being a big risk taker at that time, I applied to only one college, early decision, based on my test scores and guidance from the United Negro College Fund. My white high school guidance counselor had no idea how to advise me for college. I got my advisement through um, my mother's connections through her sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha, reading literature from the United Negro College Fund and um, the SAT documentation. I later learned that my SAT scores put me in the top 10% of black male students taking the test, a fact that I never found out until I actually studied assessment and education. That application to Ripon led to my leaving DC for Ripon, Wisconsin in the fall of 1965. It was my first long-term intercultural experience. That college had 1,100 students, seven of us were black, four of us were freshmen, and all of us worked in the kitchen. Now, here again, I was part of the first wave of black students integrating the college. My adjustment to Ripon was a process that started with a fair measure of conflict. Many of my student peers had never met a black person before, and connecting with them was socially awkward. That combination of curiosity and awkwardness led to weird events, like having two white co-eds sneak into my room in the middle of the night to feel my hair. What was that about? Um, we were curious about each other, but not equipped to share our unique experiences. And the curriculum didn't even begin to create opportunities for that to happen. But I began to notice a pattern in their responses to me. It would start with a question like, do you play ball? Uh, it was a reasonable question. I was 6'3", I weighed about 220. So, um, and I always answered, no, I'm a scholar. Um, and they would look at me quizzically. The main extracurricular activity at Ripon at that time was partying and drinking beer. Beer was 25 cents a glass, so it was pretty cheap. Um, and my adjustment, though, was not easy. Um, I felt like a curiosity. I felt like I had been admitted 
for the edification of my white peers rather than my own development. I learned to drink beer and adapted to outdoor keg parties and brutal winter weather. College was more difficult than high school and I was not so good at it in the beginning. My first year, I think I barely cracked a 2.0 GPA. But in the spring of my freshman year, like most of Ripon freshmen, I pledged a fraternity. So here I am being a haze so I can join a social group of white guys from the Midwest. <laughs> it was, uh, hazing was curious, you know, um, classic hazing, berating us, but also there was this added dimension of ethnic and racial taunts and slurs. And there was sort of equal opportunity abuse. You know, everybody's background um, was uh, a subject for some kind of negative uh, statement. But as a group, we bonded against the external antagonists in the upper levels of the frat. At the same time, though, I also formed a bond um, with the other eight other seven black students on campus. We bonded around our relationship with the larger college. Two groups with similar and divergent goals. My sophomore year saw the number of black students increase from seven to 30. And by my junior year, there were about 60. In my senior year, the black enrollment swelled to about 80 out of 1,100. We had reached a critical mass and the social life changed quite a bit. 80 black people increased our numbers, but it also increased the diversity of, the, of opinions within our group. It became harder to build consensus and maintain cohesion. It also meant that the radio station and student union board became majority black organizations. Integrating Ripon College was a six-year experiment that proved several things. First, 80 black students was too many. Second, well-prepared ur urban students of color from coastal cities could come to Wisconsin and thrive, just not too many at once. 35 seemed to be about the right number. I was a B minus student and a pre-med major looking for my next step. I had always been active in clubs, radio, and a fraternity council. And that year, I was president of my frat and in a fraternity council at the same time. In the fall of my senior year, after being elected class president again, um, I was called in to meet with the dean of students, who sat me down and told me that students like me, active in clubs, government, and Greek life, were good candidates for careers in student affairs. He was essentially counseling me to follow in his footsteps. I took his advice to heart and began to look for graduate schools of student personnel and guidance. I stumbled upon a graduate residential assistant program at Colgate University here in upstate New York. It offered a two year master, two-year master's degree in student personnel and guidance and provided free tuition, room, board, and a stipend in exchange for work in a residence hall. I applied and was accepted, and I had begun, I, I then began my formal training as a counselor. Colgate had just started to strategically integrate. The campus was using a strategy of admitting very bright but quite high-risk students of color from the five boroughs of New York City and other urban centers in the United States. My first year on campus, I worked in an all-male residence hall. I had never experienced an all-male school except for the Catholic military school my parents sent me to for two weeks. It was a bad fit. <laughs> I became convinced that all-male schools were a, a haven for the socially awkward. After chaperoning my first mixer, where the women were bussed in from nearby all-female schools for an evening of dancing with the socially awkward. The, the efforts to successfully integrate Colgate continued into my second year. The college made a conscious choice to admit students of color that were less risky and more middle class than those they had been admitting before. 
It was also announced that the college was going to be, begin to admit women. So here I'm at a college now that's decided not only to recruit students of color, but also to add women. Um, and it was the first time that I really encountered reference to the culture of a college. The arguments against women, co-eds, were specious and misogynistic. They ranged from the claim that admitting women would lower the quality of Colgate graduates to the anger that many felt that women would deprive a talented man from a seat in the Colgate freshman class. They decided to limit the number of women to about 132 of 432 freshmen per year. I think they later modified that to 600 women on campus at a time. And after about a year or two, the women were so much more talented than the men that they took all the restrictions off. And this made it uh, an open competition. Integrating co-eds and students of color into Colgate was a cultural challenge, a challenge that would define the rest of my career. My experience of integrating my high school and Ripon College prepared me for my work at Colgate. I had begun to think of college <coughs> as a cultural system into which these students needed to be assimilated while at the same time managing and resolving cultural conflicts so that they could learn and thrive socially and emotionally. For example, Colgate used to have the practice of giving students their um, scholarship checks in the financial aid office, and then ask them to walk 50 feet and give a check for $27,000 to the bursa. Now, I took over at Colgate as the director of university scholars, their HEOP program, and some of my young charges, actually five of 27, never made it to the bursar's office. These kids had never had more than a couple hundred dollars at a time. And so the college would give them a $27,000 check and say, go down there, you see that window? That check's made out to you, but you're gonna sign it over and give it to Colgate. And five of them didn't make it. <laughs> now, they cashed the checks, they bought all kinds of stuff, um, you know, and we needed to design a method for them to manage that money. So we did. Um, so that they were able to set up individual accounts so that they could pay their bills, charge their books, get their stipends um, without blowing the whole thing um, on a stereo or a small car or whatever it was that they wanted to do with that 27K. Now, uh, the adjustment to students, in my view, became a problem of acculturation, managing class-bound value conflicts, and learning to communicate across cultural group boundaries. The questions that frame my work and interventions at Colgate became my meditations um, as I prepared for doctoral study. In the fall of 1971, I asked my fa one of my faculty members, uh, and this is my naivete, right? What was the best school of counseling in the United States? They told me it was the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. So using my old one school strategy, I applied to the University of Minnesota by completing my application in Longhead using a fountain pen and registered to take the Miller Analogies test. Um, I was naive, but illegibility and messiness notwithstanding, I was admitted for the fall of 1972. Um, by then, I should have expected that I was involved in this sort of a generational thing, that I was going to encounter the issues of integration of students of color and women into the educational process. But I didn't get it. You know, I, was, I guess I was a little slow. But once I arrived on campus, I presented myself for counseling and advisement, where I found out again that my MAT scores were in the top decile for black men. My white female counselor was curious 
but never found out that my aunt used to read to me from classic mythology and Beowulf as a kid, and memories of the Greco-Roman myths and other classic cultural tales underwrote my success on the MAT. In 1972, the PhD class in the Counseling and Student Personnel Psychology program had two students of color. If you added in the prior admits, there were about eight of us in training. And like every other school I had enrolled in, the University of Minnesota was struggling to meaningfully integrate students of color into the counseling training program. I was interested in the impact of black kids watching television programs that didn't include any black characters that weren't clowns or buffoons. And that interest in the impact of television led me to the work of Chester Pierce on television and race. Now, many don't know that the father of the microaggression was also a major consultant to Sesame Street. And I became fascinated with Pierce's work on racism, microaggressions, and the cost of racism for white people. Now, Pierce was compelling to many of us in graduate training because he accounted for our experience in a different way. He also accounted for racism's costs to whites, which is something that I had never experienced. I realized in graduate school that my experience was not represented at all in the curriculum. In fact, it was routine for professors to call on students like me to offer a black perspective on the topic of the moment. Now, I wasn't prepared to teach group counseling from a black perspective, but somehow my professors figured all I needed to do was be black and in the group class. Um, but that experience actually defined the extra work of being black that Pierce described as occurring in culturally and, in, culturally and racially insensitive environments. So, you know, it sort of solidified for me, not in the curriculum, but they're making you do the work to put yourself in the curriculum for a grade. So my, you know, my first thought was, well, what are they paying the white guy for? <laughs> um, at the University of Minnesota, I became TA for Paul Peterson, who I guess in many respects is the father of cross-cultural counseling. Um, and I co-taught with him in cross-cultural counseling classes. And he introduced me to Alvin, Al Alvin Ivey, who had developed the concept of cultural expertise. Um, and once I understood it, I took it and ran. Um, I also closed the circle of desegregation by taking a job as a trainer for the Upper Midwest Tri-Racial Desegregation Assistance Center, training teachers and parents to effectively desegregate the schools. See, that job does, wasn't done yet. Right? I had I'd started in my second grade and I was still helping to facilitate it as a graduate student. I guess it takes a long time to desegregate the school. Now, somewhere along the way in the early 70s, I began to think about an intervention, a training program that combined readings, video lectures, and group experiences designed to facilitate awareness and knowledge of the impact of cultural and racial factors on education and the counseling process. I hypothesized, based on my review of the literature, that there were three basic paradigms or approaches to understanding the differences between whites and non-whites in counseling psychology. And they were, number one, the inferiority paradigm, number two, the deficit paradigm, and number three, the multicultural paradigm. And based on the paradigm or framework, context, theoretical context, you know, one could interpret differences in different ways. Inferiority meant that psychological differences between white and non-white groups um, were basically due to biological incapa in incapacity or genetic inferiority. And characteristically, these approaches use biological race as a criterion and subsequently imputed genetic or biological causality 
for any differences manifest among the races. All right? Studies conceived in that model oriented in inferiority oriented terms often were typically nomothetic in design. The deficit paradigm also interpreted difference between white and non-white groups, incorporating social deviance or pathology as the main cause because of environmental deprivation. As a basic assumption, characteristically such approaches use biological race as a criterion and imputed cultural or environmental deprivation as the cause for differences manifesting in the races. This also had a ethnocentric character and a nomothetic design. The multicultural paradigm interpreted these differences among white and non-white groups, incorporating cultural or ethnic difference as a basic assumption. Characteristically, these approaches lit did not involve race as a criterion in favor of a more dynamic construct um, such as ethnic groups uh, and culture. Differences, cultural differences as a cause of psychological differentiation. These studies in the multicultural term have tended to be most often ideographic in design. The central problem I wanted to address um, was how to represent the experience of racially and culturally diverse people in the counseling curriculum without having to hire more non-white faculty. That was very important. The faculty made it very clear to me that we didn't, they didn't have money to hire more black professors. So we had to achieve this goal without having black professors. Now, um, and while at the same time relieving non-white students of the burden of teaching their non-white faculty and peers about race. You know, because you know, every time one of those professors would ask one of us black students to stand up and talk about the black experience in graduate school, uh, it would be two or three days before our white peers would actually talk to us again, right? Because you know, you'd start to talk about racism and people would think you were talking about them. And it would take them sort of two days to get their emotions up enough to come and talk to you about whether you were really talking about them. So, I mean, it was more work and it was a burden and it was work that we really shouldn't be doing. Um, and so it just seemed to me that um, there had to be a way to relieve those uh, black students of that burden. I had the opportunity to address this problem when, as a member of my department's curriculum committee, we wrote and received a grant to develop a multi-ethnic curriculum intervention. I helped to write the proposal and was hired to direct the project. I then became a multicultural curriculum developer. That proposal brought four non-white mental health experts to campus to deliver lectures that were based, that were taped, um, and were designed ultimately to supplement the curriculum. That year, we brought Stanley Sue, Lawrence Gary, Renee Arthur Ruiz and Lori Ryan to campus. All of them were affiliated with major um, mental health um, grants provided by uh, NIMH. <clears throat> so as a result of that project, I was held responsible to produce 12 30-minute video programs and develop the reading lists and training exercises for the program. And then, of course, once I did that, I had to deliver and evaluate the training. Because after all, I was at the University of Minnesota, and they measure everything. So there was no question that I had to do some kind of quantitative exercise as part of this activity. Once that was underway and the materials were completed, uh, I applied for and was offered a position here at TC, just as my materials um, were in final in their final edition. Here at TC, I had tested my curriculum materials on small groups of student volunteers. And after another series of trial interventions, data that I gathered began to support the positive impact of the curriculum. And while I was here, I also became a desegregation program officer 
at the Institute for Urban and Minority Education. It seemed like every place I went had a desegregation center. Um, and so here again, I was involved in designing training to support school integration, 30 years after being bused to desegregate the DC public schools. So adopting a cultural expertise as a learning outcome, I developed a series of courses here at TC that formed the basis of a specialization at the graduate level. Imagine being immersed in multicultural work, scouring the APA or ACA program for relevant presentations, highlighting them, traveling to the host city, noticing that they were all on the last two days of the conference. Um, my students and I eagerly went to these presentations, only to be disappointed by how little awareness was demonstrated by our mainstream colleagues. Burdened with uninformed questions about white control groups and comparative research, I longed for an environment that was unconstrained by doubters and naysayers. We wanted to convene our own conference without the dead weight of those who didn't share our multicultural vision. In 1981, I was selected by the American Association for the Advancement of Science to be a science and media fellow, and I was assigned to study the convergence of computing and television through working with um, Teleprompter, which had the cable contract for uh, Manhattan above 96th Street. Um, spending a year that year producing P TV programs and learning to use desktop computers introduced me to the internet and digital communications. And so in 1981, I was running around presenting com at conferences about the potential of the internet to facilitate writing and editing manuscripts and scholarly publications. I remember talking to the Black Psychiatrist Conference in Jamaica about the internet and digital communications to a sea of blank faces, right? Because nobody knew what it was. You know, and they said, well, it sounds interesting, but I don't quite get it. So I began to use email from a terminal in my office and refine that capacity to support my work. The round table was an intervention in the field of counseling psychology, one designed to create an environment of intellectual exploration of ideas related to racial and cultural diversity in counseling and education. Now, you know, because I had just come out of graduate school, I had a fairly extensive bibliography. And I began to change my, turn my bibliography um, into a Rolodex or contact list. Um, and so within a fairly short time, I had a pretty comprehensive list of leading scholars in the field of culturally relevant treatment and counseling. Um, you know, a couple of them here, Tom Parham, I think is here. Um, Tom was one of my first correspondents about this project. And I wrote them all using both snail mail and email and began to promote the idea of a conference that also doubled as a four credit class. Moving this content into the curriculum for credit was a major breakthrough. Videotape lectures made hiring additional non-white faculty unnecessary and providing culturally relevant content in the, in the graduate curriculum. I worked with student volunteers and the continuing professional education team to plan the conference and use email and my Rolodex to promote the first one in, 19, in February of 1983. The first round table involved around 100 people or so and, and they came on the first day of what was then a three-day event. Yeah, it was the first time. We, we were not very smart. We, we wanted to do it for three days instead of two days. Three days killed us. Um, but it was worth every, every, uh, every bit of the effort. Um, <clears throat> so the first day of that three-day event, it snowed 21 inches while we were downstairs in the basement. We came up. Uh, and it continued to snow overnight, and we began to doubt whether anybody would come back the next day. But um, lo and behold, they all came back. Uh, they trudged through the snow, uh, we kept them warm, and they didn't have to deal with the outside again until the end of the day. And the participants were excited by the program and thrilled with the high level of discourse 
around topics related to racial and cultural issues in counseling and counselor education. And as soon as it was over, we began to plan for the next one. <clears throat> and each year, until I left TC in 1986, we built both the Rolodex and the email list until our communications became entirely digital. After TC, I continued my career at Baruch, Coll Baruch College as its Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students. Now, Baruch is one of the most profoundly diverse colleges in the country. Over 102 different languages spoken on campus. And there, we develop culturally sensitive and culturally relevant services that just didn't exist. I mean, I, I went to the schools like maybe 14,000 students. They didn't have a career center. They didn't have a health service. Um, there was no child care. Um, and so basically we began to build the services from the bottom up with an eye toward making sure that they were uh, effective and available to students from all um, ethnic and racial backgrounds. And some of the programs that we did were clearly designed to help facilitate cultural adjustment. You know, we, all, we had mock, um, mock business lunches. We had mock cocktail parties. Teach people you know, which forks to use, how to conduct themselves in professional settings. Um, you know, it's just one day I had this epiphany. Everybody here doesn't use a knife and fork. So, you know, you ask a kid that doesn't use the knife and fork to go to a business lunch, they're going to be uh, kind of at a disadvantage. So it's important for people to understand the social and cultural protocols, and that's just not part of the curriculum. So uh, we developed those services, and my question there had always been to the people at Baruch, you have been given this gift of profound diversity, so what are you going to do with it? You know, and for years we would like drag it out and point at it and say, look how diverse we are. And I would be there saying, and so what are you going to do with it? Um, and so today, I'm proud to say that after maybe 30, 30 years of prodding um, and promoting and developing cultural competence, working towards social justice as part of the college strategic plan, so now, in black and white, it says goal five of our strategic plan is to teach cultural competence, promote social justice, and racial equity. Now, you know, having a colleague say that out loud, put it in black and white, um, once you publish that strategic plan, then when you are evaluated, you know, you're held accountable for that strategic plan. So now, for the next five years, we're going to be held accountable for our capacity to achieve those goals. Um, and so now I think there's a little more teeth in that question, what are you going to do with it? Now, um, I'm here with you at the round table, and it is clearly an institution. It's continued for 37 years as a point in the calendar where those interested in race, culture, education, and applied psychology can come and count on learning about what is new and exciting in the field. So today, as I stand here before you, I'm wondering what's next um, for this entity, as it has become an institution in its own right after so long. It has been nurtured by many stewards up until today. And at its heart, though, the round table is essentially a network. And so, in this age of digital networks, one has to ask, what's next? What can this in-place network of psychologists, educators, and others become in the 21st century? As I close, I want to challenge you to think creatively about how this network can be put to use in the service of our shared multicultural values as we suffer under white male hegemonies, last desperate gasps. Thank you for your attention.
So we have what, 10 minutes? 10 minutes? Um, so we have 10 minutes. Um, I can answer some questions or stand up and give a speech if you want. <laughs> Always concerned when there are no questions. First, I want to say thank you so much. I'm so grateful to hear from you. I am curious if you have any recommendations, actually, of what should come next in light of the history that you've seen and the projection of where you think we might be going. Well, you know, I think that the primary value of networks um, is transmission and sharing of information. And the capacity for that now, I think, um, is tremendous. You know, it doesn't take very long. You know, I can send you an email, I could tweet, I could put something on Instagram, and it'll be readily available to my network, you know, in a matter of seconds. Um, so there's tremendous communication capacity, linking capacity. Um, there's also the capacity to work um, collaboratively at a distance. Um, which again, you know, um, offers the potential for all kinds of interesting collaborations um, and shared products. Um, but I think, you know, it needs um, some measure of structure organiza and organization. Um, and that, I think, um, you know, has yet to be uh, imagined. Uh, thank you for uh, all the work that you've done and for your speech. Um, I'm just wondering, since you've had the longevity in this field, how have you dealt with um, maybe fatigue around how slow change can be? And yeah, you know, um, I, ha I haven't dealt with that well. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's it, um, you know I'm very impatient. You know. Um, and change in academia, you know, is so slow, so incrementally slow. Um, so, you know, I, I have, I find myself taking um, great pleasure in tiny steps. Um, but, um, you know, there's a big part of me that just says this should have been done a long time ago. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm annoyed that it, that it hasn't happened. Um, but, you know, it is what it is, you know. I, I'm, I've made a commitment to work in uh, educational institutions, and they change very slowly. You know, it's like change, like turning a battleship. You know, it's like, ooh. Um, and so, you know, it's just you know one of the adjustments that I that I've had to make. It doesn't it doesn't fit with my personality. I would like things to be like lickety split, zip zip zip, um, and we can get some of those things done. On a on a, a small scale, um, but the big picture it just it just creeps. It's like a glacier, you know, very slow. I had a similar question to her, um, and thank you so much. Uh, actually, I have two. Have you written an autobiography? I have not. You know, um, you know, this starts to look like it. You know, it's like a little bit of it. Um, you know. I, it's only 22 pages, so I would have to expand it a bit. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think you know, um, you know, coming into public school in 1952-53, it just sort of set me up to be part of that generation that you know showed up and integrated things. You know, there wasn't a group ahead of me, and so when I showed up, my generation showed up. There was one or a few of people like me in this place, um, and our job was to integrate it. Nobody knew what that meant. You know, most people assumed that it meant that we were there to assimilate. Um, thank God that um, you know people figured out that it was interactive and things went both ways. Because um, I, you know, I I don't think. It would have been um, as interesting a place to live 
if we had all assimilated starting in 1953. Um, and I think the um, intercultural exchange that resulted in all these 21st century white rappers um, has gotten under the skin of, of the powers that be. You know, if you uh, Google radical multiculturalism, you, you'll come to understand that there are those who see cultural diversity um, as a threat to the stability of Western culture. Now, um, I guess back in the 70s, when did we call that the, what was that, the crest theory of genetic color competition? No, which said basically that you know white racism was built around the fear of genetic elimination. And so, you know, now we, we have, you know, politicians and you know, far-right activists saying that stuff out loud. So um, I guess it wasn't too much of a secret after all. Um, if, if the other question was, uh, thank you so much for that. The other question was, what are some ways that you took care of yourself through this journey, um, not to avoid burnout, but more just to um, make it less? Well, yeah, I mean, there are certain things, activities that I engage in that that feed me, right, emotionally and um, and aesthetically, you know. Um, so I like to read. Um, I like to take photographs. Um, early in my career, um, my wife and I bought 20 acres on, in the mountains up in the Catskills, you know, so, you know, when things get very crazy, I just jump in the car, take my dogs and my wife, and we get out of here and someplace where you could just hear crickets and frogs. Um, and so, you know, those things, I think, give me the emotional space to sort of regroup and come back on Monday and, you know, get back in the trenches. So we all need to buy a couple of mountains? <laughs> or, or at least a cheap camera. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for providing this platform for all of us for all these years. I very much appreciate your work. Um, I'm curious as to if you have any recommendations when we're dealing with the institution that doesn't um, embrace diversity. What should we do and what are the small steps that we can be proud of? Well, I, I think, you know, as I said, to take, to take great pleasure in incremental movements. I think that's important. Um, and to um, also collaborate with like-minded colleagues, whether you're a student or a professional. Um, you know, it's very hard to take on an institution by yourself. It's much easier to do it um, in a group of, of like-minded souls. Um, you know, there, there have been days where, you know, you know, I come home and I'm kind of despondent about um, the amount of progress um, that's been made. But then if you take the long view, right, you know, when I started this journey, there was nothing, right? I think, you know, the first article I read by Paul Peterson said that there were a handful of multicultural counseling training programs, mm -hmm. training courses, actually, um, in 1978. Um, now, if you Google that today, I'm sure you'll find that there are many more than a handful. Um, and so a part of that gives me um, some measure of comfort, right? Um, you know, I sort of look at the generations of people that have come through um, this institution and this event, um, and that gives me some measure of comfort. Um, you know, it, it reminds me even more now in 2020 that um, this is not um, something that I'm doing by myself, right? And that there are lots of people now um, that have sort of picked up that um, baton and are carrying it forward, um, and that just makes me feel better.
Thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. um, it's clear that you've accomplished so much and you've made it sound very easy. Mm. <laughs> um, a, a few of the last questions have kind of touched on the threat that people see in this field and um, the difficulty that we, we may all face in, in trying to make these changes. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the pushback that you've received in different projects that you've tried to to bring to reality and how you navigated those situations, maybe how you compromised to still make those incremental changes? Well, you know, one of, one of the things that, um, that I'm starting to write about is this whole phenomenon of when you know, when you're the first black person to assume a position of power and authority, all of a sudden white folks decide that you need a lot of help. Um, and so, um, you know, and part of that help, um, I think, is, is well-intentioned. Another part of that help, I think, is just monitoring. Um, and so, you know, um, I, I feel like, you know, that, that process, that process of, okay, oh, I finally got here, I'm finally in charge. Oh, where did all this help come from? Um, you know, is, um, is something that I had to adjust to. So I take the help, you know, um, but I also direct the help, right? I mean, uh, this is not help. You know, if it's not helping me do what I want to do, then it's not help. So I have to try to drive that assistance right, um, in the direction um, you know, that I really wanted to go. Um, and so even though um, my helpers may not have been sent to me with the best of intentions, um, I try to convert them into um, allies and move the program forward. Um, and I think the good news is that you know, the multicultural agenda um, is potent, attractive, and impactful. And so it's not very hard for um, my external helpers to get on board once they understand what we're trying to do. Um, you know, it's, um, it's frustrating. Um, and I think, like I said, it was a couple years ago I wrote a paper. I think it's going to be published um, soon where I talk about this phenomenon that I call the Obama syndrome. You know, it's sort of like when you get to be the, the first black one, um, you know, then all of a sudden people want to give you help or redefine the job you got. And so it's like it's driven out of um, a fear and anxiety, right, about essentially you know, black authority. Um, but um, it's not... Um, it's manageable, I guess is what I want to say. It's manageable, especially because um, it's so damn predictable. <laughs> um, and it's the predictability that makes it manageable.